As a disclaimer, the content of this series, both from the host and the guests, does not aim to provide professional advice or services to listeners who are experiencing menstrual pains. It aims to introduce how music can be used as a tool for experimentation on menstrual-related pains. Welcome back to Music for the Uterus. I'm your host, Katherine Chang, and in this segment, we're diving into the main phases of a menstrual cycle. Then, we'll switch our focus to the transformative moment and milestone for menstruators called menarche, or the very first period. To provide some more context and background on the actual menstrual cycle and the changes that occur in each phase, let's focus a little on each of the four main phases of the cycle. Typically, a full menstrual cycle lasts approximately 28 days long. I say typically as many menstruators experience irregularities that either increase or decrease the length of their cycles as each person experiences different cyclical changes. We'll focus more on this in the next episode. The day that bleeding first begins is the first day of a menstrual cycle. This first phase is called menstruation, which commonly lasts one to five days. During the menstrual phase, the uterine lining sheds, which causes bleeding and is often associated with symptoms such as abdominal cramps, muscle soreness, and more fatigue in most people. These symptoms are related to the low estrogen and progesterone levels during this time. Overlapping with the menstrual phase is the follicular phase, which actually begins on the first day of the cycle, which is the first day when bleeding begins, as I mentioned earlier, and lasts until the last bleeding day of around day 13. During this phase, The pituitary gland in the brain releases follicle-stimulating hormone, also known as FSH, which stimulates the ovaries to develop follicles, where one dominant follicle later matures and is released into the uterus. Estrogen levels during this phase rise and help rebuild the uterine lining that was lost during menstruation. In this time, The rising estrogen levels also help with increased energy, enhanced moods, clear and watery cervical mucus, and a stronger sense of mental stability. On around day 14 for many, ovulation occurs, often referred to as the climax of the cycle. During this phase, there is a surge in luteinizing hormone, or LH, which is triggered by peaked estrogen levels, causing the ovary to release an egg. Most people during this fertile window of typically five days experience increased libido, egg white consistency cervical mucus, positive moods, and maintained energy levels that linger from the previous follicular phase. After ovulation is the luteal phase, which typically occurs after ovulation up to the day before bleeding begins again. Post-ovulation, the ruptured follicle forms the corpus luteum, which secretes progesterone to maintain the uterine lining for potential pregnancy. If fertilization does not occur, then the estrogen and progesterone levels fall. This decline in hormone levels could lead to premenstrual symptoms, or PMS, which occur typically a week before bleeding again. Premenstrual symptoms during this time could include extreme mood swings, irritability, appetite changes, and physical discomfort, including soreness or pain in different body parts, such as breasts, the abdominal area, or having headaches. Then, the whole cycle starts again when bleeding occurs again.
Menarche marks the onset of menstruation and is often celebrated across different cultures. It's a rite of passage, and we'll explore how music can play a vital role in this journey. Menarche, often referred to as one's first period, is a pivotal moment in the transition from childhood to womanhood or adulthood. It is a time of physical, psychological, and mental changes, and many females experience a mix of excitement, confusion, and sometimes anxiety. For example, the late Clara Thompson, a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst who specialized in the psychology of women, noted that in Victorian times, females experienced a loss of freedom, power, and spontaneity at menarche. This sentiment added onto the cultural and societal denial of menarche and menstruation altogether, a lack of robust and ingrained ritual to mark the menarche, and the inability to understand internal bodily changes due to hormonal shifts, all contribute to a shared sense of lowered self-esteem in adolescent females. In my conversation with Andrea, she shared with us some stories around her monarchical experiences. My name is Andrea. I have a background in speech pathology where I actually uh, use music quite frequently. But for the past four years, I have um, been working at Lady Technologies as the community manager for KEG. Well, I started my period when I was almost 14, which was late, con you know, considered to be late by a lot of people. All my friends had started their periods a year before. And when I finally started mine, it was unbearable. The cramps were, I literally could not even sit up. So I wouldn't be able to attend classes. I'd be curled up in a ball on the floor in my classroom. Um, and so I, my mom took me to the doctor and of course I was told, oh, that's just normal PMS cramps. And, um, I was gaslit for like three years. I was put on high dose birth control, um, without ever having had an exam at the age of 14 to make it more bearable. But I always knew there was a problem and I was always every appointment like I just don't think this is normal the, the consistency of the blood was not normal um, and the pain was just so severe it was the most severe pain I've ever had in my life but they insisted that oh this is just normal it will get better with um, birth control and I didn't at the time understand the implications of birth control and I was always in the back of my head concerned about, well, what if I ever have to go off the birth control? Like, how am I going to survive? So I took myself off of birth control when I was, I believe, 17. And I essentially hemorrhaged. And uh, that is finally when people started to take things seriously. And we found out that half of my uterus was blocked from the septum and wasn't able to menstruate. So that's why I was having such severe cramping. Uh, that's why I was having such severe endometriosis that was getting worse every month. And um, that big bleed was, was it literally breaking open a little bit um, from the pressure of so much, so much built up blood. So I had surgery after that. And after that, people started to take me seriously. With the significance tied to the monarchical experience, there still exists a general idea that this transition is a dichotomy of positive and negative. Many believe that menarche is either a life-changing, eye-opening moment that females anticipate and are prepared for, or it is a shameful, traumatic, and painful experience that is merely another occurrence in life. However, menarche is a complex, multifaceted transition that holds both positive and negative aspects and is a moment of change for every individual who experiences it. Music has the incredible ability to mirror and amplify our emotions. During this time of transition, 
young women may find solace and empowerment in music that resonates with their experiences. From using music to help relieve premenstrual symptoms or to improve the moods of listeners experiencing menarche, music can be a holistic approach to acknowledge, document, and guide listeners through the pains experienced as menstruators. To explore and get a small taste of how musical incorporation can improve your mood, let's go through this short exercise together. First, for some more background, we will generally focus on the more passive aspects of interacting with music, but I do encourage you to engage with music as you feel your mind and body flow, such as singing along with songs using your body or instruments to create sound, either with the songs or on your own, and even singing out lyrical melodies with your own words. In this session, let's first start by sitting or lying down somewhere comfortable. Take a few deep breaths. In. Out. In, out, get a sense of your body. Notice the ways your body parts are resting. How do you feel? What emotions are you carrying now with you from the very moment you woke up to this moment now? Are you feeling heavy in your chest? In your head? In your stomach? Or are you feeling light and airy and expansive? Try to fully sense all of your feelings, all of your emotions right now. Now, I want you to think of a song, any song. The first one that flows into your mind when you acknowledge and notice your feelings. Take a moment to recall any memories or associations you have of this song. What does it remind you of? How does this song make you feel? How do your memories make you feel? Now, I want you to sing it, or hum it, or simply listen to it. Sing it, or hum, or listen to it for however long you feel. Pause this moment, if you'd like, before continuing on listening to this episode. How do you feel? Do you notice any change in your mood, the feelings throughout your body, or your emotions? If you were experiencing any sort of heaviness or discomfort earlier, have these feelings changed, if at all? Music can act as a boat that carries you across a river, taking you from one place to another, whether that be from a place of discomfort to another, more comfortable one, or from a moment of sadness to a neutral or even content one. Whether the river is wild from a thunderstorm or gently bobbing you along, The boat guides you across the waters with ease. 
the song you choose can also act as a journal for you, one that not only takes you from point A to point B, but also acts as a form of documentation that reminds you of your human nature, of your feelings, and your experiences. It can be a point of reference, one which you can return to for a sense of tranquility, familiarity, or safety. For those who are experiencing menarche or reliving your experience of your very first bleeding, this simple interaction with a song you love or feel could also be a tool for you to explore it with when you experience physical pains such as premenstrual symptoms or frustrations and inexplicable low moods that are felt deeply on the inside. Now to bring in some insight from a professional, I've asked Dr. Daniel J. Levitin to come on to this series and speak a little on his understanding of how music plays a role in guiding us through our experiences in life. I've also asked Dr. Levitin to share some of his knowledge on how music plays a role in relieving pain for those who listen to it. I'm Dr. Daniel J. Levitin. I'm a musician, a neuroscientist, and an author, founding dean of arts and humanities at Minerva University. And um, I've always been interested in art and science and never felt that it was a good idea to make somebody choose between the two. Um, even though people, I think our culture is that you have to do one or the other. I've, I found that not to be true. Dr. Levitin also speaks a little about the different elements used in music and our experience of music as a whole. We, we do know that music uh, can relieve pain. And my lab showed just a few years ago that when you listen to music that you like, your brain releases opioids. Uh, I mean, the same kind of opioids you would take in a pill or smoke in, in opium or in, in, you know, take in heroin, your brain releases these in small amounts, but thickened amounts, and that helps to provide pain relief. And I like your idea of mood matching, that we use music to match our mood, and that helps us to better sort through whatever it is we're going through. The last thing a depressed person wants to hear is a happy song because that's just someone else who doesn't understand them. I asked Dr. Levitin what he thinks is the most important component in music. Your question about, well, okay, well, there's timbre and there's rhythm and there's pitch and there's harmony and there's meter and there's tempo and which of those are offering the pain relief. Um, I think it's, it's a mistake to try and atomize music in that way. It's the, it's the whole thing. And if one element were off, it would stop working. So just imagine your favorite song with all the elements in place, but being sung by the singer you hate most. Or imagine that it was played at a tempo that's so slow, 
like one beat per hour. To wrap up this segment, really integrate I want it. to remind all listeners that menarche is a completely unique, beautiful, and fascinating part of a menstruator's life. By incorporating music into this milestone, we can celebrate and embrace every one of the changes that come with it. Thank you for joining me in this exploration of menarche through the lens of music. I hope this episode has allowed you to gain another tool to help navigate and guide you through any rocky waters you may encounter now or in the future. In our next episode, we will continue our musical journey through the next stages of a menstruator's experiences. Until then, keep listening, keep singing, and keep feeling. Thank you for tuning in.